Chapter 6, Shorty's Shortcut For a moment, Nancy froze at the sight of the ghostly steed galloping across the meadow. Then she raced toward the fence, calling the alarm. At the same time, a yell came from the stable. Phantom! Phantom! It was Shorty's voice. Saddle up, everybody! There were answering shouts as the cowboys appeared on the run and dashed to the stable. The other girls rushed up to Nancy, who was staring tensely over the fence into the meadow. Chief joined the excited group. He began barking and made a beeline for the phantom horse, which had turned and seemed to be floating toward the end of the meadow. Soon the mounted ranchman thundered out of the stable. Shorty took the lead. Come on! This time we're going to run that critter to earth. But the phantom horse was already far ahead of the pursuers. Only the dog was getting close. As the girls watched, the eerie figure reached the stand of trees at the far end of the meadow. In the wink of an eye, it vanished. Bess drew a shuddering breath. The ghost's gone, right into thin air. Nonsense, George said gruffly. How can anything disappear like that? asked Alice. It's amazing, Nancy admitted. We should have been able to see it glowing among the trees for a few moments. Suddenly, she remembered the prophecy that destruction would follow any appearance of the phantom. Come on, she exclaimed. The real trouble is somewhere else. She and the other girls hurried back to the house. All seemed quiet there. A glance into the kitchen showed Aunt Bet trying to calm Mrs. Thurmond. The girls hastened on to their rooms. With an exclamation of dismay, Nancy stopped in the doorway. The room she shared with the cousins was a shambles. Pillows were ripped. Blankets lay on the floor. All the drawers had been dumped. Alice ran next door to her room and came back to say that it had not been touched. Someone wants us to leave Shadow Ranch, all right, George declared. More than that, Nancy said thoughtfully. Someone may be looking for Francis Humber's watch. But only we girls and the Raleighs know Mary Deer gave it to Nancy, Alice objected. You're forgetting the man in town, Nancy said. And Dave. Both were very much interested in it. Well, where is the watch? asked Bess, looking fearful. I'm wearing it, said Nancy, under my sweater. Before supper, she had changed to a yellow blouse and skirt with a matching slipover. While she and Bess and George began to clear up the mess, Alice hurried to the kitchen to tell her aunt and Mrs. Thurmond what had happened. They hurried back to help. By the time the beds were made again and the pillows replaced with spare ones, the men had returned. The phantom got away, Ed Raleigh said gloomily. Chief was at his heels, but he has not come back, and it worries me. I'm sorry, said Nancy. I'm afraid we have other bad news for you. Quickly, she reported what had happened. The purpose of the phantom is clear, she declared. It's to frighten you and attract attention to the meadow while the real damage is being done somewhere else. If we could only catch the thing, it would surely give us a clue to who is doing all this, Ed Raleigh said and Nancy agreed. The next morning at breakfast, Dave reported that Chief still had not returned. The phantom got him, poor dog, Mrs. Thurman said dolefully. Same as it will get us all. As soon as the meal was over, Nancy said she was going out for a canter. She put on riding clothes and hastened to the stable where Tex saddled a handsome bay for her. Nancy was a skillful rider, and she enjoyed the gallop in the meadow, looking for clues to the phantom. But whatever marks it had left had been obscured by the pursuing horsemen. At the far end of the field, Nancy rode into a stand of cottonwood where the strange creature had vanished. Here she found a path which led to the foot of the mountain and up the slope. Had the phantom gone that way? Nancy reined her horse about and hurried to the ranch house, where she rounded up Bess and George. Want to join me in a search party? You bet, her friends chorused. Shorty offered to lead them, and within half an hour the four riders were following the path up the mountain. It was a steep, high climb. 
All was silent except for the creak of saddles and the clop of the horse's hooves on the stones. Finally, the path leveled off and they came to a narrow stream which they splashed across. This is just a crick now, said Shorty. But come one good cloudburst and it'll turn into a roaring flood so bad only a river horse could cross it. That's the kind you're riding now. They're big and don't get rattled. Know how to swim with the current. Near noon, Nancy suddenly reined up. Listen, she said. Somewhere among the rocks overhead, a dog was barking. Apache chief? Within a moment, George glimpsed the roof of a cabin among the crags above. Maybe chief's up there, she exclaimed. Nancy observed that it looked as though the path they were on would lead to the cabin. I know a shortcut. Come with me, Shorty said quickly. He rode ahead and led them to a side path. He explained to the girls that the other route became impassable further up the mountain. After they had ridden for 15 minutes, Shorty stopped, pulled off his hat, and wiped his forehead with his bandana. I gotta confess, we strayed onto the wrong trail, he shrugged. No use going back up. Getting too late. We better make tracks for the ranch. Disappointed, Nancy and her friends followed him along a new trail, which eventually rejoined the first path. They reached Shadow Ranch in mid-afternoon. When they dismounted in front of the stable, Shorty said, I'm mighty sorry we didn't find that dog. Nancy replied, So am I. She could not help suspecting that Shorty had pretended to be lost and deliberately kept them away from the cabin. She made up her mind to go back. The three girls discussed the possibility of his having double-crossed them. I'll bet he did, George declared. At the house, they found Alice waiting for them, her face glowing. Nancy, she cried out. Mary Deer says the artist's name is Bercy, and he lives in a cabin on Shadow Mountain. The older girls exchanged meaningful looks. Alice, Nancy said happily, I think I know where it is. We'll go there tomorrow. Maybe we'll find Chief, too. That night, Alice came to the girl's room. She was puzzled. If the artist was her father, why was Chief with him? I wish I could answer, said Nancy. And Alice, dear, please don't get your hopes up too high. It may not be the cabin where the artist lives, although I have a hunch it's connected with the mystery of Shadow Ranch. As Nancy spoke, she was turning the old-fashioned watch over in her hand. Absently, she ran her finger along the front edge and suddenly felt a tiny obstruction. She pushed it, and instantly a thin lid sprang open. Why, it's a secret compartment, she exclaimed. On the top side of the lid was the small faded photograph of a handsome man with flowing dark hair. That must be Dirk Valentine, Nancy cried and showed it to the other girls. In the frame next to the picture of the man was a tiny corner from another picture. That one's been torn out, said Alice. It must have been a photo of Francis Humber, Bess observed. Carefully, Nancy removed the old picture. On the back, in faded ink, was the initial V. In tiny script under it were the words, Green Bottle Inn. In where? asked George. Perhaps the place is named on the back of the missing photograph, Nancy suggested. Let me see it, Bess requested. Nancy handed her the watch. Bess looked it over carefully. Finally, she sighed, replaced the picture, and put the timepiece on the dresser. What can that odd message mean? If... At that moment, the girls heard a dog whining. It came from somewhere in the darkness beyond the portico. Alice jumped up. Listen, she exclaimed, maybe that's chief. End of chapter 6